Russia's foreign minister has accused the United States of militarizing the Asia-Pacific region, pumping missile defense systems into South Korea and Japan in what Moscow thinks is a disproportionate response to the threats posed by North Korea. Speaking to reporters after hosting his Japanese counterpart Ko no Taro on Friday, Sergei Lavrov voiced concern that South Korea and Japan are now both territories hosting U.S. anti-missile systems. Lavrov said the systems are being deployed in the region under the guise of responding to North Korean nuclear threats, but in reality they are miraculously surrounding Russia and China. He disagreed with Kono, who said the anti-missile deployments will not damage Russia-Japan ties. The French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian has said that Paris will enhance cooperation with Beijing in civil nuclear power, the aviation industry and technological innovation. Le Drian made the remarks when met with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Beijing. This is the French top diplomat's first visit to China after taking office in May. The two sides also exchanged views on regional challenges as well as fighting terrorism. Wang Yi said the 19th CPC National Congress has opened a new era for China's diplomacy with great powers like France and that it will provide historical opportunities for the two countries to deepen bilateral relations. China's special envoy to Pyongyang was reportedly denied a one-on-one -on -one meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un when he visited the country last week. Citing multiple sources, the Japanese daily Nihongezai Shinbun says Kim snubbed Sung Tao in protests of Beijing's refusal to lift sanctions on the regime. The paper said the move shows North Korea is desperate to shake off the economic hardships caused by international sanctions. The report also also suggested Sung, who is director of Chinese International Liaison Department, was left out in the cold because North Korea perceived him to be of a low status. China has stressed the need for a diplomatic solution to the North Korean nuclear issue, but had limited high-level exchanges with Pyongyang in recent months. Five. Military glory and world peace. That's the slogan of the seventh military war games announced in Wuhan on Friday by the Chinese military and the International Military Sports Council. They also unveiled the emblem and mascot of the event. The games will be held from October 18th to 27th, 2019. We work hard to make the games a peaceful gathering in which soldiers of various countries learn from each other get to know each other and exchange military concepts and culture so as to make the games memorable for all participants. The military world games are organized by the International Military Sports Council. They have been held every four years since 1995 and they are regarded as the military Olympics. China is now hosting them for the first time. Military forces from more than 100 countries will participate in 27 sports. The president of the council expressed great hopes for the event. We started also a new establishment in the season uh, capabilities. With, with the power of China, we can send very clear message for the entire world. We are going to, to invite the leader of the countries, head of the countries. We are going to invite minister of defense, high authorities, just to show them our desire for the peace. The municipal government of Wuhan will co-host the games with the military. All the participating athletes are from around the world with different cultural background. So we will do our best to provide them with customized services, taking food, for example, and religion into account. Wuhan won the bet for the games in 2015. There will be 31 venues and 11 are now under construction or renovation. Wang Tihua is the general manager of the local company Wuhan Sports Center Development. He's leading the team upgrading the VIP reception area of the event's largest venue. This stadium was built for the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2007. 
It has never held any big international multi-sport event, so to be able to meet the standards for the upcoming military world games, we have to largely upgrade the reception capability of the stadium, giving it a much higher level of quality. Well, John McCain, uh, following up, say the greatest harm to our national security and our military is self-inflicted. We'll see if, uh, with the money, flows uh, a little bit better safety record. Always good to see you, sir. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks for having All me. The best. Yes, ma'am. Military calls mishaps. More pedestrian language crashes of planes, helicopters, and ships killing more service members than those dying in combat. With us now, Harry Kazianis, Director of Defense Studies at the National Center for the National Interest. Harry, good to see you as always. Um, John McCain, obviously a longtime supporter of the military, calls these self-inflicted wounds. Agree? I agree 100 percent, Leland. And, and look, let's face it, just because you have the world's biggest, baddest military, a, a superpower, it doesn't mean that your equipment can't get old. And let's face it, this, this plane that we're talking about today, this C-2, as the previous segment pointed out, it was built in the 1960s. Now, you can keep replacing, you know, engine parts, you can keep changing the oil, you can keep fixing the electronics, but those airframes, those engines, they're only built for so many thousands of hours of usage. And keep this in mind, too. Think about all the other planes we use on a daily basis. Think about the B-52 bomber. It's called the B-52 because it was built in the 1950s. And a lot of our airplanes have hmm. this problem. We're using a lot of old military hardware that hasn't been replaced. That's a problem. Well, it's a problem not only that it's old, but if you think about it in terms of military readiness, uh, there's now two Aegis class destroyers that would be used for missile defense that are out of commission, unable to provide protection. You've got half of the FA 18s. Uh, that are supposed to be able to fly off carriers. They can't even fly, much less have bad safety records. Who's to blame for all this? 
Well, I, I think the blame is on, in, on many people in many different institutions. I think sequestration obviously took a hammer to the U.S. military. You know, military budgets can be cut for many good reasons, but when you just take a hammer to it and there's no strategy involved just because it's a budgetary gimmick, that creates a lot of damage. I also, we have to also keep in mind, too, a lot of our, our airmen, sailors, marines, they're working 100-hour-plus weeks in a lot of instances. They're getting tired. They're that, getting that begs, worn out. That begs an important question. Is there a leadership issue? And I ask it because of this. You never want to take a knock at our military. Right. But if all of a sudden you have a situation where ships are running into each other in calm waters, clear skies, and you have the head of naval operations saying we've got a real problem here, is it time for more heads to roll? You know, I don't think it's time for more heads to roll. I actually take a very different tack, and I agree with actually the president on this. Think back in the 2016 campaign when the president was talking so much about things like burden sharing, of having our allies do more. Think about this fact. Japan only spends 1% of its GDP on its, on its defense. It's only $48 billion. If our allies stepped up to the table a little bit more, you know, helped us patrol these sea lanes in Asia and deter North Korea or China, some of these burdens could be passed on to them. I think it's something hmm. we really need to have a discussion on in this country. We simply can't do everything. Well, and to, and to that point, and to the president's point, we've seen China, uh, we've seen, pardon me, not China, we've seen Japan step up their military spending. We've seen them look at perhaps redefining their constitution in the light of the Chinese threat. We've seen the South Koreans also uh, step up. Speaking of the president, uh, this is what he had to say yesterday as he met with uh, members of the U.S. Coast Guard. We're building up wealth so that we can take care of our protection. And we're ordering tremendous amounts of new equipment. We're at $700 billion for the military. And you know they were cutting back for years. They just kept cutting, cutting, cutting the military. And you got lean, to put it nicely. It was depleted, was the word. And now it's uh, changing. Is that really changing, though? Because the defense authorization bill hasn't gone through. Sequestration hasn't been lifted. It's going to take time. I mean, that's the thing. We can throw lots of money at this problem. But again, if we have sailors, airmen, Marines that are exhausted, that are, that are working these long hours, long shifts, mistakes are going to happen. So that's why important what President Trump has done to push on our allies, to spend more, to have more men and women out there on the front lines with us. The challenge here is, is that, like I said, being a superpower, we, we can do a lot of things, but even superpowers have their limits. Yeah.